Today, I just want to finish part two of what I started talking about last week on Easter, which is the way of the cross. And the big thing we looked at last week was this, that the cross is a way of life. It's not just a one-time event that we look back on. And I think this is so important for us as Christians to grab a hold of. When you're becoming a Christian, you're not just, you know, praying this simple little prayer. Oh, well, it's a wonderful start. But it's not just praying a prayer. And I'm so glad Jesus died for my sins. And then now I, you know, I live. It's you're actually taking up the way of Jesus. Christianity, Christians, we're meant to become like Christ. And the one we follow showed us how to overcome evil and how to love the world. And that is by crawling up, or not crawling, but climbing up onto a cross and dying for his enemies, dying for his opponents. And so when we call ourselves Christians, we're meant to be like Christ. And so we looked at this whole thing, you know, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. There was no part of Paul's life where he didn't want to take the way of the cross. This Jesus getting up on a cross and overcoming evil by giving himself, not by demanding, not by taking, but by giving himself. Paul said, I resolved. It was a choice. And this is the same choice that Paul is challenging all of us to make and that Jesus invites all of us to make as, Christ- as Christians. I resolve to know nothing. I'm going to put the way of the cross into every area of my life. My relationships, Paul says, my ministry, everything I did with you and my leadership, I resolve to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then, so what does the way of the cross look like? And then Paul goes on, right? We looked at last week, I came to you in weakness, right? Paul didn't come with, and and we looked at all this last week, it's just a quick review, but Paul didn't come with all kinds of amazing speaking ability. He didn't raise millions of dollars and, and may, you know, have this big, powerful, uh, you know, mega ministry with lots of influence and a great worship band and, you know, some of the things that we enjoy here even at Crossview. But Paul didn't have any of those. He did his ministry in the way of weakness. He didn't try to advance God's kingdom by strength. And the fact of the matter is, the ministry he founded in Corinth wouldn't have looked like much in our day. We, this would not have been a church where we would have said, oh man, they're having, you know, international conferences every year, and, you know, Christian leaders from all over the world are flocking to hear. This is just a struggling little group of house fellowships. Like, honestly, we have to remember, just because we read Paul's letters in the New Testament now, we might have built up this image of Paul in our mind that he's this incredible leader. He himself said, I'm a terrible speaker, and I'm not a powerful leader. And his ministries during his lifetime were small. We would not have read about these ministries in Christian magazines. And Christianity, by the way, in general in Paul's day, was weak. It was nothing, nobody in the Roman Empire was looking at it in Paul's day and going, wow, what a powerful new religious movement this is. He was were struggling little groups of people, a tiny minority. They didn't have, you know, in the Roman Empire, they, Christian holidays weren't celebrated. Like, you know, in our culture, everybody got a day, pretty much everybody got a day off, not just Christians last week, or actually the week before, Good Friday, Right? On Christmas, our whole culture takes a bunch of time off and gives presents, even though they're not Christians. Like, we actually have a lot of influence. We have cultural influence in power as Christians in our society today that they did not have back then. So back in Paul's day, and then this gets to where I wanted to explore this a little bit here today. Because in Paul's day, the way of weakness wasn't a choice. Like, when Paul said, I came to you in weakness, that wasn't a choice he made. It's not like, you know, I could do the mega ministry route, I could do the millions of dollars, big buildings, you know, millions of followers on social media route, or I could do the weakness route. He didn't have a choice, all right? The church in Paul's day just was weak. They didn't have religious freedom, they didn't have political influence, they didn't have Christian politicians, they didn't have Caesar's ear, all right? They were weak and they had no options, So then the question comes, though, how radically different have things gotten for us today? The world here in Steinbach, Canada, North America, that we Christians 
inhabit, how different is it than the world Paul inhabited? Because we actually do not have to live in weakness. In fact, in many ways, we have what Paul would have been astonished at in terms of strength. We do have money. We sit here in a nice building. And now it's actually nice weather outside of Manitoba, but the rest of the, the, the year, we wouldn't actually wouldn't even be able to meet if we didn't have a nice building, right? We have buildings. We have Christian politicians in this area that represent us. Like, we don't, we actually don't Ha, look, we don't live in weakness like the church in Corinth lived and like the churches in Paul's day lived in. So the question is, how then are we supposed to apply this message? Paul said, I resolve to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. How do a bunch of Christians living in a position of strength apply Paul's words that we are to live the way of the cross in weakness? Does it mean, all right, does the way of weakness require that we North American Christians today give up anything and everything that makes us strong? So that's the first question. Is that, like, how do we live now? Our, our context, totally different. We do have strength. They didn't. So does that then mean that in order for us to be good Christians, in order for us to follow the way of Christ, do we have to give up everything that makes us strong? And by the way, there have been Christians throughout church history who have gone this route. They took vows of poverty. You know, they had, they had money, or if they had titles and power, they renounced those. They went and lived in monasteries. They, they literally thought it was wrong. In order to follow the way of the cross, we need to give up everything that makes us strong. And they actually literally did that. So the question is, is that what we have to do? And if not, how do we as North American Christians actually live the way of the cross in the world where, where we are? Well, let's first of all just tackle this problem of do we have to? Do we have to give up money, influence? Should we withdraw from politics entirely? Do we have to give up our strength in order to live the way of the cross? And first of all, let's just pay some attention to some other stories in Scripture to make sure that we have some wisdom in this because... Even though Paul in the early church was very weak, we do have other stories throughout Scripture where God's people had strength. For example, Abraham. And here he hadn't had his name changed yet, so he's just Abram, but I'm going to keep calling him Abraham. Um, but Abraham had become how wealthy? Very wealthy. Not just a little bit wealthy. Abraham had become very wealthy in livestock, but most of us don't care that much about that one, but in silver and gold. He had money, all right? This guy was wealthy, all right? And yet, in the book of James, we find this. In the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited, credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. So on the one hand, he was very wealthy, silver and gold, not like Paul, not like the early Christians who did not have a lot of money. They were very poor, all right? And yet, he was called God's friend. So clearly, and by the way, we can look at a whole bunch of other examples in Scripture as well. Clearly, having money, obviously, it's, it's not weakness in the same way. But having money doesn't, it doesn't, isn't automatically bad. Having money doesn't automatically make you not a friend of God. So we have to keep this in mind. This is, we have to keep some of this in balance as we discuss this, as we look at this. What about like political power? All right, what about political power? Do we have to give up titles and influence in our country in order to live the way of the cross? Because Paul and the early Christians, they certainly did not have political influence. All right? But again, we have stories in the Bible where people did have political influence. Here's just a couple. Daniel. Prophet Daniel, man of prayer, godly man, was one of the high up officials in two superpower empires in his day, the Babylonian Empire and after that the Persian Empire. That was Daniel. So clearly it's possible to be a follower of God, to please God and have power. All right? Joseph is another famous one. God specifically raised Joseph up to be the second most powerful man in the Egyptian empire. Second only to Pharaoh. 
And God did that in order to save the, 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 uh, his family, the, 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 you know, the new Israelite nation that was being birthed, and the Egyptians from famine. So clearly having power, we could go on and on, Esther and David, although he abused his power quite badly a few times, and Solomon, but clearly it's not bad to have strength or power. How then do we use them? Well, let's just sum this up quickly and as we explore then how to use power in the way of weakness in the cross. But let's just sum up what we've thought about so far. First of all, it's not bad for Christians to have power and strength, whether it be political, financial, influence, charisma, and talent. If you have talent and skills and abilities, great. You don't have to pretend you don't have them. It's not bad for Christians to have power and strength. But... Thanks to Paul and Jesus and the writings we find throughout the New Testament, we do find that God's kingdom thrives even when we have none. So we have to hold these two things in tension. The early church had no political power. They had no money. They had no influence. And yet the church thrived. And we are their descendants spiritually today. And we thought last week too about, I think about Christians, you know, 100 million Christians in China today and the tens of millions of Christians in places like Iran and India where they have, you know, no power, no political influence, no money, no big buildings, no freedom of, of religion, none of that stuff, no freedom of speech. And yet God's kingdom thrives there. So it's not bad for Christians to have power and strength, but as long as we remember that God's kingdom thrives even when we don't have any of that stuff. By the way, that should be a huge relief for us, no? Should that be a huge relief to us? I think of how many of us as Christians nowadays, and I, I talk to so many people, some of you here today, I think of how many of us are like nervous and scared you know, and there's people we're listening to online on social media, and there's, there's all these different voices out there today that we can listen to. And many of them make really convincing points about, oh, things are getting really bad, and things are getting dark, and oh, the culture's going downhill, and all sort of stuff. And as we listen to these things more and more and more, we just get stirred up. And of course we do. When you're constantly listening to bad news, it's like it's just, oh, things are getting bad. Things are getting dark. And it starts to feel to a lot of Christians like things are about to fall apart. And right when things, you start to feel like things are about to fall apart, you need to remind yourself that God's kingdom thrives even when we have no power. The church in China is not dying. And it's, they have nothing like what we have here. They have no religious freedom. It's not dying. The church in Iran is not dying. The church in India is not dying. The church in the first century Roman Empire did not die. Guess what? No matter how bad things get, and by the way, they're not as bad as a lot of people think they are. But no matter how bad things get, no matter how shrill some of the voices are that you're listening to, I want you to remember that God's kingdom thrives no matter what. His kingdom has lasted for 2,000 years, and it's not about to fall apart now. It isn't bad for us to have power, but God's kingdom thrives nonetheless. Which brings us up to a very important point three on this positions of strength. When we do have strength, when we do have influence, when we do have talent, charisma, freedom, whatever it is, whatever kind of power or strength we have, this is how we don't wield power and strength if we're going to live in the way of the cross. Power wielded in fear, and I added self-preservation because fear is a self-preservation emotion. That's why God put it in us. That's actually a good thing. It's what keeps us from just sticking our hand into the toaster while it's on, right? It's the thing that makes us watch out for our kids when we're near a busy road. God invented the emotion of fear to keep us safe. And it's what it is. Fear is a self-preservation emotion. Now, here's the thing, though. Not all the time we're feeling fear. Should we be feeling fear? Or not, and not all the time that we're feeling fear, should we be acting on that fear? When we use our power, our influence, our money, whatever it is, our freedoms, when we use our power in fear and self-preservation, 
that. So it's not bad to have power. Joseph had power. Daniel had power. Abraham had power. It's not bad as Christians to have positions of power or finances, those things. But when we wield that power out of fear and self-preservation, that is not the way of the cross. I mean, think about it. If Jesus had been worried about self-preservation, there wouldn't have been a cross. Right? If Jesus had been concerned about protecting his freedoms and his life and not dying and not giving, if he had, if he had been behaving out of fear and self-preservation, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. That's what the cross is. It's a rejection of self-preservation. That's literally what the cross is. I reject protecting myself, and I give myself to my very enemies for their good. The way of the cross is the opposite of self-preservation. In fact, Jesus explicitly said this. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he said something that I find very fascinating. He said this. Matthew 26. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And they come to arrest him and put him on a cross. And he says this. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? He didn't have to go to the cross. He did have power. Jesus was not powerless. If he wanted to protect himself, he could have called down 12 legions of angels. And right now, you know what? I'm done with this stinking Roman Empire. I'm done with these religious leaders. And we're just going to fix things by force. We're going to fix things by making people do right, by making people obey me and listen to me. He said, I could do that. Like, do you not think? Do you not think I can just call down 12 leaders? This is what he says to them. And he say, now what caused him to say this? What happened in the, in the three verses right before he says this? You know who he's talking to right here? Peter. Do you know what Peter has just done? Let's go and read it just a couple of verses before. So these guys come to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then the men step forward. They're hiding. It's dark. What they're doing is wrong. Seized Jesus and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions, we know from John 18, that it's Peter. Peter reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. And remember, nobody goes for the ear. He was going for the head, right? And this guy ducked. I mean, it would, have been a cooler, it would have been a cooler miracle if Jesus would have put the head back on. <laughs> but Peter's not going for the ear. It's not like, I'm going to get your ear, you little. No, he's going for the head. Guy ducks. Okay, he gets the ear. All right? Now, this is such a famous story. You know, we don't think about it that much. Yeah, of course, this all happened just before the cross. Let's just put ourselves in Peter's shoes for just a moment. How would you feel if bad, wicked, evil men came in the night and you're hanging out with your best friend and Messiah, Jesus Christ, and bad men come in the night when they should not come with weapons and violence to arrest and hurt your good friend Jesus, what would you do? Well, I would just take the way of the cross. Yeah, right, you would. <laughs> Peter was packing heat. I'm using. So he pulls out his sword, and he goes for it. Now, let's just think of a couple more things before we look at this anymore. Let's just think of a few things, because we often get pulled into the way of the sword because we think, yeah, but we're in the right Think of all the ways Peter was right and the people he was against are wrong. Peter was 100, except for the sword. I'm not talking about the sword part. We'll get to that in just a moment. But leading up to him pulling out his sword, he is 100% right, and the, and the men coming against Jesus are 100% wrong. They are evil. He is right. Theologically, he's right. Jesus is the Son of God. He's right. He is right morally. It's not like Peter's wrong. Jesus isn't mad at Peter because he's wrong. Peter is 100% right. He's right about Jesus. He's right that these men should not be sneaking around in the middle of the night to arrest them. These are bad men. They're in the wrong. Their morals are wrong. Their theology is wrong. And yet, 
even though they are 100% wrong and Peter is 100% right, it's still wrong, according to Jesus, for him to use the sword in self-preservation. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. How often do we as Christians, by the way, Christians, I can't emphasize this enough, here just right around Easter. Following Jesus is not just a ticket to heaven. That's what a lot of Christians think it is. It's a, it's a taking up of a way of life. We were just up here, Marlon and, and Caleb, talking about baptism. You, if you are baptized in the, into, into Jesus, you are baptized into a way of life, the way that Christ showed us the way of the cross. So you are thinking to yourself so often, because when you're fighting with people and when we're fighting with the culture, yeah, but we're right morally. And they're wrong and they're evil and we're right theologically. And you make all these lists in your head and then people on YouTube and on social media get us amped up even more about how right we are and how bad things are. And by the end of it, we just think, ah, we got to go out there and we got to kick some butt in the name of Jesus. Maybe not butt, but it's Sunday morning. <laughs> Going to kick some stuff, right? And Jesus would love a public service announcement at the end of each of those videos and podcasts we listen to that get us all riled up about how bad things are and we got to rush out of here and do stuff. And at the end of it, Jesus comes on, oh, by the way, put your sword back. Put your sword back. That is not the way of Christ, no matter how right we are, no matter how wrong somebody else is. That is not the way of Christ. And one of the reasons why, you say, why is it not the way of Christ? Besides the fact that this is who God is, the creator of the universe loves in a self-giving, sacrificial way. But also, you realize that when we use the sword to try to advance Jesus' interests, Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said, for, because, why? All, and notice the all, not some, all who draw the sword will die by the sword. It's a live by the sword, die by the sword principle that Jesus gives us. By the way, this is not just for battle. This is for all of our life. The more you use force in your relationships, in the church, in the home, in politics, the harder you push, it's the law of live by the sword, die by the sword, the heart, the more you get resistance back. By the way, this is also a law in physics. The harder I push on this pulpit, the harder it's going to push back on my hand. There's going to be an equal and opposite force in the opposite way. I mean, we can, we can apply this from the little to the big. Parents, if you use force constantly to get your kids to do what you want, guess what? Over time, they're going to push back more and more and more. It's just, and it's not because there's sin nature. And I just got to break their will. I just got to break it. Which is just a bizarre thing to say about the children we love. But anyway, the more you, I'm not saying, you're know, saying it's never good to use force. I'm not saying that. There might be times when we're to keep someone safe, you have to use force. There will be times in your parenting when you just have to use relational force, and that's it. We just, you just have to do this. But the vast majority of the time we use it, it's simply because of a lack of imagination. It's just easier. We just use it because that's the only way we know. That's the way of the world. How do I get my spouse to do what I want? I push. How do I get my culture to do what I want? I push. And then we're surprised when the culture and our, and our kids and our spouses push back. Because that's not the way of the cross. All who draw the sword, Jesus said it. All who draw the sword will die by the sword. It'll just come back to us. The force we use will come back to us. I could do a whole series on that within relationships, but we'll just leave that for now. That's another time. This is where Jesus shows us a different way. Look what he says. I have to jump over to Luke for this one. But here's in the Garden of Gethsemane right after Peter cuts off the guy's ear. No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. I sometimes wonder if Jesus was physically here today. In his physical body we could see. 
would he join us in all of the culture wars we're involved in? Would he be leading the charge with a sword? Or would he be telling us, just like he said to Peter, no more of this. Stop it. And how shocked would some of us be when he would cross over to the other side? This guy who lost the ear was a bad guy. He's a bad guy who wants to hurt Jesus. He's a bad guy who does not have the disciples' best interests in mind. He's a bad guy who wants Jesus' kingdom stopped. But Jesus crosses over to his side, touches him, and heals his ear. I wonder if Jesus was physically here today, how many of us, and I, I have to look at myself constantly, how many of us would be shocked when he went over to who we think of as our enemies and started to walk among them, touching them and healing them rather than fighting them. In Jesus' kingdom, strength is not shown by the use of force to defeat one's enemy, but by the willingness to die while loving and serving one's enemies. Something we need to keep in mind if Jesus wanted to do things by force, you realize he could do it right now too, hey? You ever think about that? The next time you feel yourself just getting a little bit out of hand, like, oh, I'm just so worried, things are out of control, I'm getting upset, I'm getting mad, stuff's getting dark, I want you to just remind yourself, wait a minute, Jesus has the power right now. There's a lot of evil going on in the world. He has the power right now if he wants. We don't have the power we don't have the power. He does. He has the power right now. If he wanted to, he could come down to earth right now and change absolutely everything by force. The fact that he doesn't should give us pause when we start to feel ourselves feeling afraid and angry. If Jesus can continue to look down on earth and all the stuff that's going on in our world right now and continue to stand by patiently continue to love his enemies patiently, how much more the Christians, we who follow him, and are meant to live in the way of Christ. Being a Christian is not just a new way of winning. It's a new way of living. Now the question then comes though, are we just supposed to do nothing then? Like we gotta do something. There's something in us as human beings. I gotta do something. It's dark out there. Are you saying as Christians, we just become so passive, we just do nothing, and oh, you know, we just love people and just do whatever. But okay, no. I want to show you what we're supposed to do in the way of Christ. Because in the way of Christ is not about doing nothing. If Jesus had done nothing, he never would have gotten crucified. He never would have come down to earth and lived among us and stood up to the powers and been crucified. Living the way of the cross is not doing nothing, and it's not being a coward. Let me tell you what three pillars of the way of the cross are for us today. It's not doing nothing. Here's three pillars of the way of the cross. Live our values. Serve the weak and the oppressed. Love our enemies. All of these are actions. All of these are actions. And I'd love to do a sermon on each of these. And we will someday. We'll come back to it. I just want to finish this sermon just on the live our values. Do all of this in the name of Jesus. When you start to feel like you're doing nothing, remind yourself of these three things. The way of the cross means I use my power, my strength as a North American Christian who does have power, who has some money, who has some political influence, who has religious freedom. How are we going to use our strengths in the way of the cross? We can do three things. We're not doing nothing. We're going to live our values. We're going to serve the weak and oppressed, and we're going to love our enemies. That's not doing nothing. This is how... We resist. This is the resistance. It feels like it's epic from some kind of a movie or something. It probably is. Let's talk about live our values. Many of us have gotten pulled into a swamp that promises much and looks and sounds passionate and powerful, but often which ends up taking us far away from the way of Christ. And that is this, this swamp of getting all worried about how bad things are and then thinking we have to fight to make people who don't even follow Jesus think and live the way we do. It's not our job 
to make people who don't follow Jesus all around us do what Jesus calls us to do. It's our job for us to do it. Our job is to just live our values. I want to take you, and I could show you this throughout the New Testament. We could spend hours, and I could show you this theme throughout the New Testament. Let me just take you to a passage here, Philippians chapter 2. Live our values. This is our job. Paul says, do everything. How much? I just want to make sure that we have this. Does any of you know what the Greek word for everything means? Everything. It's a powerful Greek word. It means no exceptions. So do how many things? Help me. How many things? Everything. Everything. Without grumbling or arguing. Don't. And we could add here, and freaking out. <laughs> do everything. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 no. But everything's so bad. A guy told me, he, I listened to a podcast yesterday, and he took me through a list of how bad things are getting. Therefore, I'm very angry and upset. And Paul says, whoa, 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 whoa. Bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. Do everything, every single thing. Without grumbling about how bad things have gotten and arguing about how horrible things are and the whole thing's going to pot and hell and handbasket and blah, 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 blah. Do everything without grumbling or complaining. Why? Okay, let's keep going. There's a comma. It's going to get better. So that who, who, you, that's us. He's talking to Christians, right? So you, that's us. So that you may become blameless and pure. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Paul, where is the part about the culture around us is supposed to be blameless and pure? That's the part we want. Like, we got to get upset, and we got to get strong, because the culture isn't living blameless and pure. And Paul says, whoa, 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 whoa. You are supposed to be blameless and pure. Paul does not expect the culture to be blameless and pure. Look at this. Children of God without fault in what? A warped and what? Crooked generation. How high are Paul's expectations for the culture surrounding the Philippian church? How high are they? Low. They're low. Paul does not have an expectation that the Roman Empire he lives in in the first century should support his Christian values. He does not have an expectation of that. He expects that the world, which doesn't follow Jesus, won't follow Jesus. By the way, can I just tell you something? If the world could follow Jesus without accepting Jesus, why would we need the gospel You ever thought about that? If the world could follow Jesus without actually accepting Jesus, we wouldn't need the gospel. So why would we expect that a world that hasn't accepted Jesus live the way we think they should live? Paul says the point is not that they live correct. The point is that you may become blameless and poor, pure, and not poor, Children of God without fault, we are supposed to be living pure and blameless in the midst of a crooked generation. He goes on, then you will what? Shine. Then you will shine among them. That's our job. Our job is not the culture wars, it's a culture contest. To show the world something so beautiful, it makes what they have pale in in comparison, and they want the Jesus that we're offering. It's not a culture war. It's a culture contest. We're standing there showing them Jesus until they go, wow, that looks amazing. You will shine among them like stars in the sky. By the way, there's no shining in a light place. Paul expects darkness to be dark. 
He expects us to be light. He expects us to live bravely in the darkness and shine with the love of Christ. That's Paul's vision. So let's just sum this up from Philippians 2, and then we're going to finish with some, some more Jesus. Here's how to live our values according to Philippians 2. Stop grumbling and complaining about how bad things are. Sure, say it in passing sometimes. It's not bad to have conversations. It's not bad everyone's all talk about, oh, I don't know about this. I don't, here's this trend. It's not bad. But when that's all we do, stop expecting the world to act according to Christian values. Like shocking. Do you, do you think Chinese Christians sit around all the time and talk about, about how it must be the end of the world because they don't have religious freedom? They don't. And there's 100 million of them. Show the world the beauty of Christ by the way we live. That's not doing nothing. Living our values is not doing nothing. It's why we're here. And then Jesus casts us this vision. The world needs to see us live. You are the light of the world. You, that's us. The way we interact with people, the way we interact with each other, that's how the world gets to see Jesus. You are the light of the world. You know what that means, right? A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. I just want to say, and I want to say, and I want to say this so carefully because this is not an all or nothing thing. But I do want to say something based on this. If our calling is to be a light in darkness, it means we Christians can't just pull out of everything. I think it's great that there's Christian schools. I think it's great. Nothing wrong with that at all. I don't want anybody to think I'm criticizing any of that in Christian universities and all sorts of stuff. But if we all just pull back, if we all go to a Christian school, if we all just pull out of public schools, how does the world see the light? And again, there's lots of good reasons to do it. Our kids spent some years at a Christian school. Nothing wrong. Lots of you went to Christian school. Don't hear. Nobody's bad. You're all good. I love you. And I'm not saying everybody has to do it one way. I'm just saying if all Christians pull out of Hollywood, and by the way, and then we shoot, nobody shoots their wounded like we. I watched a thing on YouTube the other day. This guy, how many of you know who Alan Richson is? Very few of you. He's a very, very big man. He plays Jack Reacher in the Jack Reacher TV series, which I am not recommending to you. Okay? I would never watch that kind of filth. If you think it's filth, then it's bad. I'm not. I am not recommending you watch it, okay? But anyway, but he's a Christian actor. He gets pot shots all the time from other Christians. How can you be acting and these shows aren't Christian and there's some swearing and blah, 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 blah. He gets all these shootings from Christians. It's like Christians should only act in only ever Christian movies. I love that there's Christian movies. But how does the world ever see the light of Christ if we all pull out of Hollywood? If we all pull out of politics? If we all pull out of every public thing that's out there? If we all pull out... How do we live this? But you say, yeah, but the reason I'm doing it is because I'm scared. Totally get it. And some people do it. Some people should pull out. That's, I totally, there's a place for it. But if we all pull out, guess what? Living the way of Christ takes courage. It actually takes courage to live the way of Christ, to go into the Garden of Gethsemane with a sword and not pull it out and use it, but to go there and to die for the, for the ones who are opposed to you actually takes courage. The way of Christ takes incredible courage. But actually, aren't we convinced that God wins in the end? Neither do people light a lamp and hide it under a bowl. Instead, look at this, they put it on its stand. Get out there and live for Jesus. Instead, they put it on its stand. Get out there in the midst of the vile darkness. And be a light by the way you love and treat people. 
That's Jesus' vision for us. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light. Oh, one more. Let Jesus drive it home. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The way of the cross is show and tell, not fight and force. It's show and tell. We live the way of Christ and we show the world a better way and then we talk about it in reasonable tones. We talk about it in reasonable ways. The next time you find yourself being afraid, and again, I, this is an invitation. Being afraid is not fun. I'm not mad at people for being afraid. Being afraid doesn't, isn't, isn't a great way to be. The next time you're, you feel afraid over something like, hey, our culture doesn't define marriage the way we do. You know what you do about that? Live a marriage that makes the culture want what we have. Guess what? We're doing a bum job of that. Here is so much sexism, abuse, and all kinds of dirty relational stuff going on in Christian marriages. How do we dare get up to our, in public and get mad at everybody else for the way they're talking about marriage? Step number one, live a Christ-like marriage. When the world wants to put people to death, let's be the first one at the bedside giving people a reason to want to live. It's show and tell, not fight and force. But what if our culture doesn't want what we have? What if the world doesn't listen to us? What if our culture ends up being a semi-truck that just runs us over? Those are some big what-ifs that a lot of Christians have today. Here would be my response to that. Why are we so worried about that? Why would we expect any different? Jesus got run over. He also rose from the dead. All of the apostles who gave us the New Testament got run over. Paul got run over. Peter got run over. He ended up crucified upside down. Why do we North American Christians in the 21st century expect that it should be different for us? This is what it means to be a Christian. It means we embrace giving ourselves for others. I want you to bow your heads and I want you to close your eyes. The darkness that surrounds us is real. And Jesus isn't asking you or I to do nothing. He's asking us to leave out of here today and just live our values. Live it in your marriage. Live it in your friendships. Live it in the way you talk to your non-Christian neighbors and coworkers. He's asking us to serve the weak and the oppressed. He's asking us to love our enemies. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. Give us the courage to now live that for the world to see. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.